welcome to the home edition of COVID-19, enthesopathies and tendinopathies. The biggest difference is that enthesopathy is much harder to say. By the end of this lecture, you should know how to say enthesopathy and also have a basic understanding of what an enthesopathy and a tendinopathy is. And you'll also learn why people use terms like golfer's elbow and tennis elbow, because those are much easier to say. So here are the objectives for today's talk. Identify common enthesopathies. Hopefully they, don't, they won't be around in too many more slides. And tendinopathies, review anatomy. Describe the pathophysiology of, there it is again, enthesopathies and tendinopathies, and also develop a basic understanding of treatment. These tend to, for whatever reason, these are kind of high yield step one areas, um, so that hopefully will be helpful at some point. Um, quick review of anatomy, the elbow is a troco, troc, trochogingelimoid joint, which means pivoting hinge. Also, pivoting hinge is much easier to say. It allows for bending, flexion, and extension. It also allows for rotation. In form rotation, the radius rotates back and forth around the ulna. The ulna is more or less the center of rotation of the forearm. Um, the two motions of rotation are supination, which is palm up, and pronation, which is palm down. If you're interested, I also have another uh, lecture um, on uh, the ECMC and I think Channel 2 website on elbow pain, which covers the same topic in about 53 seconds without commercials. Um, this shows forearm anatomy, again, the two joints between the radius and the ulna, the proximal and distal articulations. Um, and now we'll get into kind of the meat of this talk, enthesopathies. The definition is a disorder of a bony origin or attachment. They are degenerative in nature, not inflammatory, and they're thought to be due to aging, repetitive youth, use, or, yeah, not repetitive youth, because that would be aging, same thing. Um, repetitive use or idiopathic, which means, of course, it's caused by idiots. No, that's not really what it means. Um, tennis elbow is the common term used for lateral epicondylitis. Pain usually occurs in tennis with hitting a backhand, particularly hitting a backhand late, and I'll explain what that means, or other activities involving resisted wrist extension. There are many more cases of so-called tennis elbow in non-tennis players than in tennis players. For some reason, I just noticed top of the slide says tennis and elbow, but it should just be tennis elbow. Um, epicondylosis is really a better term for what's going on because it's not an acute inflammatory reaction. It's really more degenerative in nature. So even though people don't use the term epicondylosis, it's a better term to use. It, physical exam is characterized by tenderness at the lateral epicondyle of the distal humerus, and the primary tendon involved in the process is the extensor carpi radialis brevis. This is why I mean by hitting a backhand late. So this is the greatest tennis player of all time, Serena Williams. Um, in the picture on the left, she's hitting a backhand. Note, it's in front of her body. Um, minimal strain on the elbow. On the slide, the picture on the left with a green background, she's hitting the backhand late. And you can kind of even see um, the, uh, of the, this arrow shows up, but right here, where she's firing her, ECR, her ECRB and all of her wrist extensors, but she's in a suboptimal position, which puts a lot more strain on the area. So it tends to be more common when people kind of hit the backhand late. In her case, because she's playing some, someone really, really good, in most people's cases, because they're using improper technique. Golfer's elbow. Um, is medial epicondylitis. It's also known as forehand tennis elbow or suitcase elbow. Um, it's associated with activities that involve repetitive wrist flexion and forearm pronation. That's important because the, the concept is, you know, you get back to your anatomy, what originates at the medial epicondyle, and that is wrist flexors and your pronator teres, at least the uh, uh, humeral head of your pronator teres. And is characterized on physical examination by tenderness at the medial epicondyle of the distal humerus and as I said, it involves the flexor pronator origin. Um, here is uh, a great golfer and a bad golfer. So, in, in the, there's pretty good studies looking at this. Um, the top is, of course, the greatest golfer of all time, Tiger Woods. Professional golfers at impact do not pronate their low hand. They basically, they pronate their lead hand, but their, their uh, bottom hand actually keeps the form in supination. And even afterwards in the follow through, the form stays relatively neutral because professional golfers have a very stable club through impact. Amateur golfers tend to do this. They hit, they um, uncock their wrist quickly 
and they tend to compensate for a bad swing path by pronating really, really hard with the right forearm. And so golfers tend to develop medial epicondylitis in the medial forearm. So it's more of a bad golfer. Good golfers don't get a lot of medial epicondylitis um, in their um, trailing or bottom hand. This is the MRI appearance of tennis elbow. So basically, normal, healthy collagen, which would be ligaments, joints, um, looks dark uh, on MRI. This is a T2. This is a T2 MRI, which um, makes fluid look really, really bright. So if you spin the magnet really quickly, it suppresses fat. So in this image, bone marrow, which has a lot of fat in it, is going to be dark. Um, cortical bone is going to be very dark and tendons should be really dark. So this is the area right here where the extensors originate from the lateral elbow. You can tell it's lateral because here's the radial head. And what you see here is this little whitish area which is actually a partial tear in the extensor origin. And that is the characteristic MRI appearance of tennis elbow. For golf, golfer's elbow, same appearance, opposite side of the elbow, just at the medial epicondyle. Histologically, again, it's not like a cellular inflammatory process. You're not going to see a bunch of white cells if you take a biopsy. What you're going to see are disorganized collagen fibers, increased vascularity, and no signs of cellular inflammation. Anytime you see a slide in a lecture where they have three or four things that are true, it, it lends itself to becoming a test question um, you know, when it grows up. Treatment. The optimal treatment for tennis and golfer's elbow is not known, which is interesting because they're very prevalent, common conditions, um, but there's not a lot of basic science um, dealing with what the most appropriate treatments are. Non-operative management consists of stretching, counterforce bracing. What counterforce bracing is, is having a brace that is tight against the elbow, distal to the problem. So in the case of lateral epicondylitis, have a, a strap here which puts pressure over the extensor muscles and theoretically offloads the extensor origin. Opposite thing for medial epicondylitis, have a brace which is a little distal to the medial epicondyle to offload the um, problem area. Um, night wrist splinting, more for tennis elbow, just to have your wrist extended because it's a problem in, in the extensors. So if you hold your wrist in a slightly extended position, it takes tension off that area. People with lateral epicondylitis who tend to sleep in a lot of wrist flexion often wake up and have that area be very sore. Modality-based treatments, again, none of these have a strong level of evidence. Uh, pulsed ultrasound, acupuncture, steroid injections, platelet-rich plasma injections, and prolotherapy. The theory behind the last two, uh, PRP and prolotherapy, are to stimulate an inflammatory response. Theoretically, if you can do something to have fibroblasts kind of come into the area and lay down some better collagen, that may be helpful. And even surgery, um, if that doesn't work, you're excising the disease tendon origin and, and promoting the growth of, of better collagen. And so the surgical treatment consists of excising the degenerative tissue, um, and in some cases, either drilling or removing just the outer cortex of the bone, although the last part is a little bit um, kind of controversial. That that was the tried and true way of taking care of epicondylitis by doing uh, surgery to the bone at the level of the origin. And again, not very evidence-based, and a lot of people don't do that anymore, so that will not be testable material. So that's it on um, enthesopathies. Very common. Um, and not inflammatory, degenerative in nature, um, and even the areas that talk about kind of anti-aging medicine, how do you make these areas heal, uh, will be an area of significant research going forward and probably more cell-based treatments like doing things, maybe fibroblast growth factor, or things that can kind of stimulate healing in that area. And now, moving on to tendinopathies. Tendinopathies are chronic tendon disease. Like enthesopathies, they are not inflammatory. Basically, they represent your body's attempt and failure to heal a tendon that's having some issues. The tears are usually attritional, and when you have a complete rupture, it's not through a normal tendon. People don't get a biceps rupture through a normal tendon. They get a rupture through a tendon that has some weak area because of disease. Tendons fail more often with rapid loading. Anyone who's broken a rubber band kind of knows that. You take an elastic structure. If you stretch it out really, really slowly, you can get more length. If you stretch it really rapidly, it will fail because the rate of loading 
affects failure. So rapid loading affects failure. So people who come in like with ruptured tendons, Achilles tendon, biceps tendon, etc. Usually it'll be a rapid eccentric load that will cause it to rupture. Tendon insertion failures cause more disability than tendon origin factors. Um, that may not make sense on its own, but if you think about it, as long as the muscle tendon unit still crosses a joint where it's doing its work and the insertion is okay, even if the proximal edge is damaged or diseased, it will still function partially. It may cause pain, but it will function. If you rupture at the insertion and it no longer crosses the joint, it can't do what it's supposed to do. So in the case of the Achilles tendon, you can't stand on your toes if your Achilles tendon is not attached to your calcaneus anymore. We'll talk about the biceps, which is a pretty good example um, of tendinopathy. Quick anatomy review. The biceps has two heads because that's better than one, as we all know. The long head of the biceps, which goes, starts above the glenoid and goes through a groove between the lesser and greater tuberosities, so right through the middle of the shoulder joint. The uh, short head of the biceps comes off of the coracoid process with the coracobrachialis much more stout, does not go through the shoulder joint at all. Starts out in the front and kind of comes down the front of the elbow. Distally, the muscle bellies um, don't really emerge, but they sit next to each other. And most people have a more or less coalescent biceps tendon. Sometimes you'll see people surgically um, where the tendon is actually divided all the way down to the bone. Most of the time it forms a pretty coalescent tendon insertion. And then here we have the aponeurosis of the biceps here, which is also known as the Lacerda's fibrosis. So this is the actual biceps tendon where it inserts into the radius. Now in tendonitis, again, the short head is not going through the joint and, it, and it's, it's thicker. It, so it's not involved very much in, um, in uh, tendinosis. The long head of the biceps is totally set up to have tendon degeneration uh, because if people get older, they get any bone spurs in their bicipital groove, you're taking this tendon and having it move back and forth against a rough surface, the tendon is going to be damaged over time. And so it can either, when that happens, it can just be painful and rupture a little bit at a time, having a couple of fibers rupture and then repair themselves over and over and over again, in which case you end up with a rupture in continuity where the tendon is still in continuity, it's just much thicker than normal. Or you can have just a frank rupture where it fails completely in which case it's not in continuity. Um, so the biceps can fail in two places. Proximally, it's the long head. It's very, very uncommon without some kind of like weird coracoid fracture, shoulder dislocation or tumor for the short head to fail. So basically proximal biceps ruptures refer to the long head of the biceps. I'm speaking slowly, so it's possible. It could be a test question. If you're watching at double speed, proximal biceps are ruptures of the long head. That will probably sound normal if you, you know, are speeding it up. Uh, distal biceps, that's an insertion problem. So if the proximal biceps is ruptured, the biceps will still work. They'll, they'll have some issues, but it'll work. If the distal biceps is ruptured, then it's not, doesn't cross the elbow joint anymore. And the biceps has two important functions, elbow flexion and form supination, both of which are duplicated. In other words, there's another muscle that does the same thing. So the biceps elbow flexion is duplicated by the brachialis. Brachialis is a huge muscle, so it can kind of handle not having the biceps there. Supination is a different issue. The supinator muscle is tiny, so it can't compensate for not having the biceps. So the biggest loss when you have a distal bicep rupture is loss of supination. They have a, a different appearance. Um, again, the, we talked about this a little bit. Um, it can be attritional and continuity rupture, in which case the tendon just becomes thick, sometimes elongated, but doesn't rupture completely, or it can be acute. And the acute tears are either proximal, long head, or distal um, insertion. Here is someone who's lifting a little bit of weight, and if you'll notice, this biceps is in a pretty normal location, and this biceps is kind of moving up the arm because he just ruptured his distal biceps, and he's even kind of grimacing. Um, and so this is right after a proximal biceps rupture in a uh, world-class power lifter attempting a deadlift, which is a, and a guy who's not you know, super young, common injury in power lifters in the deadlift because you're applying an eccentric load with a huge amount of weight um, rapidly, and that's a bad condition for a tendon. This shows an MRI, an axial section, so axials like this, axis of the body. This is the glenoid. This is the 
humerus, and this is the bicipital groove. What you should see here is just kind of one tendon. Here you see sort of two. So this is the traditional partial rupture of the biceps where the tendon is in continuity, but it, the fibers are kind of split apart. So you see the dark tendon here, dark tendon here, and then fluid in the groove and also between the two parts of the tendon. Other things you see on this slide also, this is the front of the shoulder here, this is the subscapularis. We're attached to the lesser tuber osseus, and this is the back of the shoulders. So this would be the infraspinatus, and as you get lower down, it would be the teres minor, and the supraspinatus would not be in this visible in this plane unless you get a cut that goes exactly through it. This is an arthroscopic view of a not happy biceps tendon. So basically, here is the humeral head. Here is the biceps going down from the shoulder into the bicipital groove. Ordinarily, the tendon should just look white. All this red stuff is tenosynovitis. So this is an inflamed biceps tendon. It's a little thicker than normal. So this is probably an example of what I talked about where you get these incontinuity attritional ruptures where the biceps kind of is trying to repair itself. Um, and sort of is, but it's typically painful, particularly in people who have a lot of uh, um, uh, tenosynovium around the biceps. Now again, I don't want to be confusing because we're talking about inflammation interchangeably, but the primary mechanism of the rupture is degeneration. So even though you have some uh, synovitis and, and tenosynovitis here, biceps ruptures and, and uh, tennis elbow and golfer's elbow are not primary inflammatory processes. Um, and this is kind of what the biopsy of it would look like. On the bottom of the slide, you have normal organized collagen. On the top, you have disorganized collagen from inside the biceps where it's trying to heal itself, which is why the tendon kind of gets wider and wider as you make more of this kind of disorganized, more vascularized collagen that's weaker. So here's someone who has a biceps rupture. Is it proximal or is it distal? Well, this is the normal side. So here's his muscle belly here. This muscle belly is now closer to his elbow. So this is what a long head of the biceps rupture looks like. A long head of the biceps rupture moves the biceps closer to the elbow because the insertion's intact and it doesn't slide all the way down because the coracobrachial, the, the, the coracoid head, the short head of the biceps is still intact because the, the short head of the biceps and coracobrachialis are still attached to the coracoid process. So the biceps is partially suspended. So the more lateral part, which is the long head, ends up moving closer to the elbow with a rupture of the long head. Um, so when you have a proximal biceps um, rupture, whether it's in continuity or whether it's not in continuity at all, uh, treatment depends on symptoms because people actually, they get some pain from having this degenerative tendon in their shoulder that's not working properly. And so sometimes when it ruptures, that relieves their symptoms and they're left with deformity that's not painful. They may get a little cramping with repetitive activity, but for some people that's not a problem. So the treatment for proximal biceps ruptures, again, when you see that the muscle belly is distal because the rupture is proximal, tenotomy. So if the tendon is in continuity, but it's causing pain, you can just cut the tendon. You have to tell the patient, if I do that, you're gonna get a deformity, but that actually works. Um, in a thinner patient or someone who's not gonna to tolerate the deformity because of appearance or because they wanna do a lot of repetitive activity and are worried about cramping, you can tenodese the biceps where you take the long head, cut it, and sew it into the humerus, either with an anchor or a drill hole, just to hold the biceps in its normal location, but it no longer originates from the glenoid and no longer goes through the shoulder joint, so you're suspending it from the humerus. Um, and again, if, if someone has a rupture and they don't mind the deformity and they're not symptomatic, you wouldn't do any kind of surgical treatment. Here's another uh, person with a biceps rupture, um, and is it proximal or distal? This is the normal side, that's a normal contour for the biceps. When it's balled up like that, that's not a normal appearance of the biceps for most people. Um, and so here is the biceps moving up the arm. So this person has a chronic distal biceps rupture that he didn't get fixed. Um, so distal biceps, the muscle tendon unit is no longer connected to the forearm. So you lose a little bit of elbow flexion strength. You lose a lot of supination strength. Um, the muscle belly moves proximally and um, not everyone likes to have it fixed surgically, but if you want to restore supination strength, you need to have it fixed surgically um, because you won't recover um, enough. The, the supinator muscle can 
hypertrophy a little bit, but never enough to compensate for the biceps. The brachialis can compensate for a lot of elbow flexion, but you do get increased fatigue with prolonged activity. And here's someone with no problems with the biceps, of course, the great uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, as you can see. All right, that's it for tendinopathies and enthesopathies you know, for now.